morning, everyone. I'm glad to see that it wasn't just me who got too little sleep tonight. Uh, so a couple of you just a few hours ago. Um, I'd like to, to discuss today an, an overarching topic of a few research projects we've been doing over the last couple of years um, to show. Why do you want to get one screen? Uh, it's fixing it. It's going to find someone now. Okay. Um, an overarching topic that is how to break an encryption scheme end to end, as in how to find your target, how to determine. Uh, what type of attack could work against it, and then how to implement that attack um, as optimal as possible against your target. Um, we have gone through that, that process a couple of times in the last years, um, mostly against very old, yet popular encryption schemes, things you find in payment cards, in communication devices, in car keys, um, all these proprietary systems that would have a hard time migrating uh, if ever they found they are insecure, uh, yet it's easy to find that they are insecure. So um, the side topic of this talk will be um, the, the insecurity of, of commonly used ciphers in systems that aren't very upgradable. Um, on a high level, as I said, I want to talk about uh, first, how to how to find a cryptographic algorithm for you to break. Um, oftentimes, the only reason that something isn't broken yet is that nobody knows what it is. So we'll uh, we'll look into one way of breaking it, um, of finding it first. There's there's, there's a couple of um, approaches you can take to, to to finding a cryptographic algorithm. Well. Some people, like Ross Anderson, get lucky and they, they just get algorithms sent in the mail to them, as happened with, um, with the, the, the cell phone encryption cipher. Um, I'm going to show how to break later in this talk. If you're not that lucky, um, you need some way of reverse engineering. Either from, again, if you get somewhat lucky from the software implementation, um, Chances are, though, if an algorithm exists in software, somebody has reverse engineered it already. Um, that's not very difficult. Um, so, oftentimes, these algorithms, these low hanging fruits for cryptographers, live only in hardware, where you can reverse engineer them, for instance, through black box testing. We went through this exercise um, with the, the, the DECT. Cypher, DEC is also a communication device, phone used in-house, not a cell phone, but an in-house wireless phone. Um, so we found its, um, its cryptography, an 80-bit stream cipher, through um, black box testing. So we would send it inputs and observe the outputs. In this case, the black box testing was made a little easier um, for the fact that we could um, stop the processor executing this function at every uh, clock cycle and see what the intermediate result would be. So it would, it would tell us from one clock to the next what it computed or what changed. So again, that, that was a little bit of luck that somebody gave us um, an implementation that had this debug capability. Um, if you're out of luck completely, um, you'd have to reverse engineer the encryption function from pure hardware puzzle together um, the logic gates that form an encryption function. And that's actually what we're going to look at, just to, to make the point um, that no matter how well protected deeply in hardware a cryptographic function is, there's always a way of getting to it. Um, and if you have to count transistors, then you count transistors. Yeah. Following that, um, you are given a cipher, chances are a proprietary LFSR-based tree cipher, which seemed to be popular across industry um, for, for several decades, um, which still today pop up in places where, where people think they need to protect um, the intellectual property with proprietary functions. Um, so given a, 
given such a proprietary function, um, you want to uh, first estimate um, what type of attack could work against it. Um, there's trivial ciphers with, with small key sizes, say up to 40 bits. Um, those you can you can just break through brute force. Um, even though there was there was thought to be impossible some 20, 30 years ago when these ciphers were designed, today you can brute force 40 bits in a few seconds on a on a processor, faster even on, on modern graphics cards. Um, still today, some functions that are commonly used do fall into this category of of up to 40 bits encryption. It sounds ridiculous, but this is legacy, and they have just never changed it. The high tech one cipher, for instance, um, initially meant for for cars, and every BMW built up until some 10, 8 years ago uses um, the high tech one, 32 bits. So there's a couple of cars still on the road um, with the cipher. More concerningly, um, some big companies and the German government, for instance. Um, used this in access control. So if you if you enlist at the German army, you'll get a you'll get an access card with a 32-bit secret key. Um, and of course, you can brute force this in in a second on on any laptop. Um, again, um, going going down the, the the road of complexity. If if your target has a has a um, more complex cipher. Um, or, and or a longer key, um, you want to look into into more advanced attacks. For instance, attacks that trade off memory and time, um, in which you don't brute force the entire key space, um, but brute force enough of it so that the pre-computed data set gives you a hint what the key could be. We'll look into this possibility in, in a great level of detail. Um, Pretty much any proprietary cipher we have found falls into exactly this category of, of up to 70 um, bits. GSM, for instance, is, is 64 bits. Um, and that's probably the, the most commonly used um, cryptographic device in, in the world. Five billion subscribers, they claim, um, for, for GSM. And all of these devices have the capability of, of A51. Half of the world roughly doesn't use it, it chooses not to use encryption, but at least it's the capabilities in there. Um, now if, if you find a cipher that, that's over, over those, this, this, this magic threshold of, of roughly 70 bits, uh, you have to look into, into more advanced attacks um, that aren't necessarily more, more expensive in terms of computation time, but they are much more complex um, to set up because they have to be handcrafted for this specific cipher, and those attacks um, exploit statistical flaws in the cipher. So again, if this was AES or anything that, that went through a similar process, there wouldn't be any statistical flaws, but this being secret ciphers, we had to, to, to find in some hardware device, um, chances are no cryptographer has ever looked at them. So statistical flaws are common, and also we'll, we'll look into this. Um, Finally, once, once you decided on, on your attack type, um, there's a lot of optimization to be done. Um, what's always needed is a, is a very fast tracking engine um, that could either run through a brute force run for you or compute those parts you, you do in your, your time memory trade-off still type of brute force um, as fast as possible or even an algebraic attack. You, you usually end up um, brute forcing a little part of the of the key segment. So um, implementing a fast implementation um, of, of your target is, is always a good idea. And I'll, I'll touch on how to do this um, orders of magnitude faster um, than, than people traditionally work on, on graphics cards. Uh, so a new, new tool that, that just a few years ago nobody would use in cryptographic research. Um, now if you, if you just if you're stopping at brute force attack, then that's all, all it takes. It's just an engineering problem of making it as fast as possible. Looking into more advanced attacks, though, um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a whole design space that wants to be filled through through parameters. Um, if, if, say, um, you are going down that path of time memory trade-offs, um, there's, 
that there is not just this one trade-off, but there's at least four trade-offs that all want to be um, configured appropriately. So um, you need an attack strategy. And um, as I already said, if, if, you, if you want to go into the very advanced attacks, there's a lot of handcrafting needed um, around algebra, finding statistical imbalances and, and creating tools that exploit those. Um, I'll, I'll touch on all three of these and, and um, there's a little overview. We'll um, first explain how to, how to find ciphers really from, from anywhere, um, any ciphers with um, reasonable effort, so definitely more effort than some software reverse engineering, um, but just being once in the decade type exercises, um, still reasonable effort. Um, and I'll, I'll then explain how, how we um, broke uh, in realistic time and, and effort um, two of the common ciphers, the one used in, um, in GSM cell phones and the one used in DEC handsets, and it's the name of the talk. Um, does that sound good? Any, any requests from me? You can, you can interrupt me any time, of course, we have a small, small group, so feel free to shoot questions at me whenever. Um, so finding, finding um, encryption functions from hardware. Um, in the software world, we all understand how things fit together, that, that somebody creates a source code, compiles it into a, an assembly binary, um, but then whoever wants to find out what the source code might have looked like throws that binary into a disassembler, uh, has the, the, the automatic IDA Pro de de decompiler creates some, some source code for them and they're pretty much done. There may be some, some layers of obfuscation to peel off, um, but it's all very well supported by tools um, around assemblers. Uh, this disassemblers. Now the, the same um, the same logic should hold for, for hardware where also people start at a high level description and algorithmic description of what they're implementing um, and through some some some, some software um, in in this case not a compiler but what they call the route and trace tool um, this algorithm is mapped onto not assembly language instructions but gates, logic gates, but that's pretty much the same. It's um, a small entity that's, that's doing as much work as, as an assembly instruction would. And then of course those are put in order and connected somehow. There's some added parallelism that you don't implicitly have in software. Um, but you're moving everything from a high level algorithmic description to basically a Lego description where you, you take simple bricks, functional bricks and put them together. Now what should be there and what's, what's currently um, missing, at least from the normal hacker tool set, is a disassembler for this type of application. Now, of course, the input to this wouldn't be a binary file or anything like this. The input to this would have to be physical data, as in pictures of of um, of a device. Um, so we have been we've been working a couple of years now on creating a device uh, or the tool um, that does this work for you and. Um, I'll, I'll just touch on a few functional um, fun functional features of, of this tool, but um, if, if you want to get into reverse engineering things from hardware, this is probably the tool you want to start using, and it's of course open source, and um, you can get this at um, dgate.org. Um, so, what, what does the process look like to, to find now um, a function from hardware. Um, first, you of course start with with a physical device that, um, that that could be a plastic card with some some chip in it. The chip is the tiny dot between these two connections. So these, these modern RFID chips they're they're, they're ridiculously small, um, less than a millimeter in in, in size. Um, it could be that, that your your target actually is in a in a um, package or, or some, some type of epoxy package. Um, in any event, um, there will be some assets that, that, that takes away all the plastic and leaves the chip you want to take. Um, and it will either be acetone to take off soft plastics or it will be nitric acid, fuming nitric acid. A few drops of it um, take, takes away the, 
um, the epoxy. Um, none of this is, is really dangerous. Fuming nitric acid might be, but if you're afraid of using that, there's some, some safe alternatives that, that take a little longer, a couple of hours, but still um, etch away um, all the epoxy packaging. So one way or another, you will you will be left with just a, a dye of a um, of a um, silicon chip, and silicon chips, of course, are uh, exactly uh, what we were talking about in, in this compile phase. Um, they're, they're composed of, of functional units, and those functional units are connected in, in some circuits. Um, zoom in very, very deeply into such a chip. Um, the chip has, has uh, just above its, its silicon layer, um, one layer of transistors. These are little switches. And in fact, the transistor is the only um, logical device you can create on a chip. Um, in the analog parts of chip, you can also you know, create some capacitances and inductances. But uh, for the digital part we're interested in, there's just one, one instruction, if you want, the binary instruction, that is a little switch. Um, and those transistors are connected amongst each other through, through metal bridges. Um, you can see one, one layer of metal bridges here. Um, there'll be a couple more. Modern chips have something like eight interconnect layers. So there's, there's one layer that actually does something, and eight other layers that, that bind together the, um, the pieces that do something. Um, those transistors are not anymore. Back in the day, there would be, but not anymore. Put on the on the, on the surface one by one, but rather they come in functional groups. So there would be basically like assembly instruction. There would be a group of transistors that are already tied together in a certain way on maybe the first two or three um, metal layers in a way that say um, an X or, or an N, an OR instruction. Uh, perhaps something more, more complicated, but simple functions you'd also find in assembly. And then those instructions are put on the surface of the chip and interconnected just as a, as a program would, would order um, the instructions. Um, the way to, the, the, the first step of course after, um, after, after etching out the, the chips from, um, from the, um, let me flip back one here, um, after etching out the chips from, from, from their casing is um, that you want to um, get the information of each of these layer um, what, what they encode, meaning you, you, you need to take pictures from, from the surface, the highest layer of the chip, and capture that information, but then cut away this layer, um, and again, take pictures from one layer below, and again, cut through the chip, and take pictures from the layer below. Um, sounds very difficult, and, and when we started with this, people were claiming you need some and some plasma etching and some, some highly difficult to use machine and lots of training to be able to precisely cut through these chips. Turns out just polishing paper or polishing paste is enough. If you're careful enough and you have a couple of chips to waste, um, just putting down the chip on a, on a rotating surface, say a, a hard disk, some polishing paste um, will take away a layer in, in a couple of minutes. And then you take pictures and again you put it on your on your on your hard disk and, and you polish away the next layer. So this this was easier than we saw. Um, the dimensions of this in in chips we're attacking we're not attacking the most recent chips. They're mostly software driven anyway. Uh, we're take, attacking more proprietary, most custom built chips that come in, in bigger sizes. But the the dimensions of this are um, micrometer. So to, to cut away one layer, for instance, um, you take away one, two, three at max micrometers of, of stuff. Um, it sounds very small, but these chips are sturdy, so you can nicely polish away um, microns at a time. Um, so yeah, when then we then we take pictures. Uh, of all these layers once we polish them down um, using just an optical microscope. So there's, there's no magic here. Um, these pictures do kind of look ugly uh, using optical microscopes and when people do this professionally they use what's called confocal microscopes. Um, 
the uh, idea of a confocal microscope is that it that it shines um, different colors of light, basically the whole rainbow of light, um, through through the prism while adapting the depth of, of your focus. So at every at every focus depth, you shine a different color of light. If you do this fast enough, the human eye will not will not notice the different colors, but see them all at once, but at different depth of the chip. So you can image a 3D structure in, in different colors using this microscope. It's nice to look at, however, we decided to just use optical microscope and make up for the bad quality of the images through software. The goal of this is to have it as automated as possible, of course, so we're not really interested in, in aesthetic values. Um, as long as we can find some algorithm that will, that will, that will get, get back the information we lost by using cheaper equipment to capture this thing. And in fact, um, a sub thousand dollar optical microscope is all the equipment you need to do this and some uh, broken hard disk for your polishing, some polishing paste, um, little assets. That's, that's all you need in terms of um, physical devices. Um, given these images, um, we, we already said they, they basically provide um, a floor plan um, for logical functions to be placed. Um, now, of course, we want to reverse engineer each of these functions, and then in the next step, we want to understand how they're interconnected with one another. Um, reverse engineering the functions um, can, can be fully automated. Um, mostly, well, su supported by the fact that, that uh, whenever a function is used, as in one line of assembly code, um, it will be the same, the same footprint if the same function is used makes sense, right? They're taken from the library. And the chip uses something like 20, 30, up to perhaps in your chips, 50 different types. But that's it. So once you understand what these 50 types do, say, um, yeah, I'll have to zoom in a little bit more. Say these three are absolutely the same function. They are, there's some, some XOR. Um, derivative. Um, once you understand that this one is an XOR, mark this in software, say, please find all XORs for me, and just through normal pattern matching, maybe basically face recognition, where is this person in the picture, right? It will find all the instances of XOR. And you do that 20, 30, perhaps 50 times, and you find um, every single function um, on, on the surface without having implemented anything that isn't already there in all the imaging libraries for, for, for face recognition. Um, that gives you, um, on the lowest layer of, of these chips, a floor plan of, of where is what. Basically, you get a box with all the assembly instructions used in your application. You don't know in what order they that they are executed though. And that's of course the next step now. Um, that you look at, at the, 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 the layers that, that interconnect these logic functions and then you start drawing circuits. Um, that too has been, been implemented by now in, in, in DGATE as an automated feature, um, not quite as, as accurate as, as this matching feature. Um, so it's, it's still a semi-manual process in which the, the computer tells you those things are con connected to one another, please check that that's valid. When reverse engineering these small algorithms, um, they're highly optimized in hardware, meaning they're as small as possible, of course. Um, you look at something like 1,000, 1,500 interconnections between these gates to capture the entire algorithm. So this can actually be done by hand. Um, now with the, the semi-automation, um, it, it, it's being done in just a few days. Um, let me flip over this. This is just illustrating how, um, how even though all the different chips of the, of, of the different um, chip manufacturers uh, use different libraries, the libraries on the lowest layer still look very similar. These pictures are actually taken by the, by the confocal microscope. Um, at least this one is, um, but it, it doesn't have much depth difference, so you, you don't you don't get much from using a, a confocal microscope here. So the point is that um, that, that these, these 
logic functions can quickly be understood. If something consists of four transistors, like here, here's one, two, three, four, there's really only two, two things it could be. It could be NAND gate or NOR gate. Um, and judging by, by the size of these, it's, it's very fast to, to decide which one it is. Um, anyway, so back, back, back to our story. When we, when we reverse engineer, we trace all these, these logic wires um, in, in a couple of days, uh, given, given good images. Um, and we sit down and, and try to reverse engineer the function from, from large description of what is connected to what. And Starbuck um, in Berlin usually does the, 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 the groundwork, compiles a long list of, of things that are connected to each other. And the two of us sit down and, and I'll start purring them. Give me some flip flop. And then tell me where this flip flop is connected to. And tell me what, what the next flip flop is trying to find chains of flip flops. Usually we already have a good idea of what, what a cryptographic algorithm looks like. These LFS outbase ciphers, they always consist of long chains of flip-flops and a few XORs hanging off of So we, we, we start, we start um, creating, creating pictures of, of what, what things could look like. And um, this is an algorithm out of an RFID tape. Um, after the images were done, Starbucks spent something like a week of his free time tracing all the wires, and then we sat down, and after an hour or so, we had this. That was all that's needed to, to reverse engineer this, this encryption function. It's, it's, it shouldn't even be called like this. It's so, so um, it makes it a little small. Um, but so, to reverse engineer this, this encryption function, a um, cu couple of days of free time activity spent um, clicking clicking on dots in D gate, and then an hour to, to um, creating um, an understanding of what the circuit looks like. It probably took longer for me to convert now this into something I wanted to show on, on the PowerPoint. Um, but yeah, this, this is all that, that, that it took to, um, to find what, what they think is the encryption in this, in this logic prime RFID tag. Um, this is used, for instance, for access control into, into nuclear power plants. Across Europe, this is this is used by, by a couple of governments, including the Swiss, um, for for access control. Um, this is hugely popular and was the first first contactless access control card in, in the frequency band. That that's that's the, the, the predominant one now. And somehow people still buy this old card, even though it's as expensive as, as newer cards that would do RSA and AES for you. Um, and it took somebody to, to, to pile through through these, these images to, to find that this is uh, ridiculously uh, easy to break. Um, I think they're working on a new product now, but yeah. But this, this, this should not be used anymore. Logic Prime, if any, if any of your employers use Logic Prime access card, um, noticeable by the fact that they have very long reading distances, something like 10 centimeters from the reader, you can open the door tell them to please migrate to something else. Um, so th this is how we find, um, find algorithms, and not just this logic prime algorithm. We did this a couple of times, um, sometimes for, 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 for algorithms that are used to, towards the outside, more often though for algorithms that are used just inside of the chip when breaking smart cards completely different leak of encryption, and usually the smart card will, will do good encryption to the outside world. However, there will be some encryption function inside of the smart card um, that's just used to, to obfuscate whatever's on the little wires inside, and those we regularly reverse engineer now. Um, so the process is stable, and if you want to get into hardware hacking, this is probably um, what, one of the areas with a lot of logging and fruit stuff. Um, but yeah, let's, let's describe what, what we will do now to a cipher that, that you found and that isn't trivially broken like the logic prime thing in the access control cards. Um, meaning you would estimate that the computer will take weeks, months, or years to break it. Um, then you want to optimize it using what's called time memory trade-offs. And we'll, we'll discuss this um, as an example on the, uh, on the cipher that Ross Anderson was sent in the mail um, the A51 cipher that's, that's in those 5 billion devices. Um, so the A51 cipher in, in GSM, in, in all of our cell phones, um, is used the following way. Um, 
the phone and some computer at your um, at your home operator, and only that computer, even if you're roaming somewhere in the world, they are sharing a secret key. And every time the phone now wants to start encrypting, uh, say, a phone call or a text message, um, any communication, the base station, now this could be your roaming country, uh, X base station, somewhere, some GSM base station, will request a session key, a derived key, from um, your home operator. Um, it will consist of, of a random number to be sent that the phone then can use to derive the same session key and the session key itself. And then all communication is encrypted with this key. So optimally, to show that this is insecure, we want a way of breaking these keys fairly fast because they are only valid for one call and if it takes us years to break one key, probably the, the information is, is invalid by when we're done anyway. Um, so we need a way of breaking session keys in a realistic time that, that, that hopefully the call is still ongoing when we're done. So we're talking about minutes, better seconds. Um, this being a 64-bit cipher though, um, just crunching through all the possible keys on a computer takes something like 100,000 years, at least in a, in a straightforward CPU implementation. Um, so we need a better way of, of tackling this. Um, the insight into, into breaking F51 is um, that, that it's prone to, to what's called codebook, uh, um, codebook attacks. Um, in, in those attacks, and they, they, they build up on, uh, up upon how, uh, on, on, the, on the structure of, of who supplies random numbers and what goes into the cipher. Um, so suffice it to say, they're only possible because the, the randomness comes from the outside and there isn't a second randomness coming from the phone. Um, so the, this, this, um, these attacks build up on the following idea. Let's say there's, a, um, that there's some, some public um, piece of information and a secret piece of information. Um, and the public one can be derived from the secret one. Say, um, your phone number will tell me your name. Because if I call your phone, I can ask you for your name. Conversely, given your name, it's not easy for me to find out your phone number, right? There's no, no translation um, that just given a name, you would pop out a phone number. But the following, uh, now, how do, I, how do I create a data set that would tell me phone numbers by names anyhow? Well, I'll call every single phone number and ask people for their names and note that down put this in a long list, and the next time I see a name somewhere, I can look up the, the corresponding phone number. So having a mapping from the public information back to the secret information now allows me to, to just look up um, what, whatever the secret was used in computing something public. In a one this would mean if I have a mapping from all secret keys to some data that's transferred over the air, I take some data item I see on the air, look it up in my data set and find a secret that was used to compute it. Right? Um, straightforward attack that unfortunately doesn't, doesn't realistically work against I A51. Um, even though now you are down to a very fast attack, um, you need to spend um, a huge amount of resources on storing this data set. In this case, something like 100 petabytes, um, which Google may have, but we don't. Um, but now, now we establish two corner cases of an, of an attack design space. We have a, the brute force attack that takes very little resources in terms of storage, but for a long time. And the other corner case that takes huge resources, um, but uses them only for a very short amount of time. And there's a whole trade-off between the two, where you can spend some amount of storage let's say, terabytes to, 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 for, for, to keep it affordable, um, but at the sa same time save, save on, on the time spent in cracking. Um, now, let me, let me look at the time. Um, I think we're doing well. So, um, before explaining how to, how to compute this, 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 this trade-off, um, let, me, let me first do, do a little sidetrack on on how to, to, to make this A51 cipher as fast as possible. Um, I was saying earlier that, that the, the core of, of a cryptographic break is, 
is still um, creating a very fast engine. In this too, if you have a trade-off between um, number of of computations and, and amount of storage spent, we still want every single of these computations to be as fast as possible. Um, and we went through um, a, a year-long exercise of um, basically engineering uh, around this decipher to, to make it compute as fast as possible on, on, on common hardware. Um, common hardware for us was, was graphics cards, um, and since the, the goal of this now is to, to compute um, as many streams in parallel as possible. Uh, we want to maximize the parallelism of, of our, our given hardware. Um, with graphics cards, we get the following degree of parallelism. Uh, we stick three graphics cards into one computer, each of them holding two GPU processors. Every GPU processor is a multi-core. Um, in in the, 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 the graphics cards of, of last year, there were 60 cores in each of these processors. So you have six times 60 um, computing cores. And now each of these cores can be programmed um, using what's called bit slicing, or what, what used to be called back in the day, single instruction multiple data. Um, basically, a programming technique in which you compute one instruction on a string that, that's composed of different data streams. Um, and in the, in, in the uh, extreme case, just one bit of, every, of each data stream squeezed into a very long stream. In our case, 256 concurrent computations squeezed into one long long or whatever it's called on this graphics card and computed an instruction on these entire 256 streams. On each of the 60 cores in each of the six GPUs. So in every clock cycle, you are touching roughly 100,000 concurrent computations. Right? And that's the degree of parallelism you get from, from current graphics cards. Um, of course, usually this is this, this is wanted to compute as many pixels as possible, um, to, to fill screens as quickly as possible. Um, however, we just use this capability to, to compute cryptographic algorithms and um, works beautifully. So th this is this is how we, we get from hundred thousands of years to um, to a couple of computing years to um, not launch the tech but compute our data set. Um, there's a couple more optimizations that are now specific to, to A51. Everything I've said so far, of course, is, is generic and would have worked against every 64-bit cipher. There's a few things that are specific to A51. Um, one being that you can, that you can um, compute a couple of clock cycles as, at once. Um, this just decreases your, your granular um, amount of computation spent on, on, on computing A51 once. So it determines the, um, your, your, your unit, basically. Um, there's another optimization, though, um, that, that's very specific to FF1 and that, um, to my knowledge, nobody so far has been exploiting. Um, and for that, let me you know, um, empty slide. Um, so, um, function, the cryptographic function is statistically sound if all outputs appear with the same likelihood, right? Because if it wasn't so, um, then you'd have a statistical bias that, that may, may give away something about the key, or at least you're not using your key um, as good as you could, um, pigeonhole principle. If, if certain things are more likely in the output, say there's two, two inputs, two secret keys that result in the same output, that means there's one output at least that doesn't belong to any key, right? They're colliding those two on the one output. So if the input and output are equal size, the other um, output can never be reached. Now that is the case for A51, being a non uh, nonlinear feedback shift register. Back in the day, people would use the feedback shift registers, and they have this statistical property of beautiful output distribution, but they're weak for other reasons. So today, people. Uh, use nonlinear feedback shift registers um, where 
um, let me draw it like this, um, where several several inputs can result in the same output, and those um, those, those outputs eventually form a circle. Um, so every every time you compute something, um, you're either moving on the circle or you're moving closer to the circle. Does it make sense? So this one and this one have the same output, um, meaning that at least one of them cannot be part of the circle anymore, right? So I think you're considering um, a feedback which is sort of not invertible. Right. Or it's not fully in the circle. But that's fine. It's a string cipher. In fact, the only property that makes it cryptographically strong is that it's not invertible. Mm -hmm. Generally, you use anti cells in such a way that you can, you can have, can be a small cycle. But you just can compute the previous state with a coding. Well, that's how you would use an LFSR, but then you, you need some other element of providing um, non-linearity. If a, if a cryptographic function is completely linear, that means you can compute it forward and backwards, and you can reach the, the output from the secret key, but also the secret key from the output. And that's, of course, what you want to prevent. You can construct an FSR that is vertical. And for which you cannot have scan collisions. Well, every LFSR is invertible and doesn't have collisions. But LFSRs are bad, bad building blocks for cryptography. N LFSRs. N LFSRs. Well, the, the N means that it must be nonlinear, meaning like this, this behavior is actually wanted that two things map to the same function. Not necessarily. You can interrupt your register, and you, either you are in a cycle, or you will be in a cycle, but you won't find an equation, because you can deterministically compute the previous state. So if you pick a random state of your register, the chances are large that you are in a small cycle, so you will look over a cycle, and over the fiber, but you in finding collision just because you can compute the previous state. Well, we, we should take this offline, but I'd be interested in seeing a, a function with these properties. It, um, it, it feels like this would be hard to construct and would, would, would require a lot of uh, like online checking. Uh, and of course, this, this is a function composed of, of some 400 little gates, 400 assemblings, right? And there's no, no space for checking anything, right? Um, well, in any case, what, independent of whether it could be strong, this one isn't, um, and it's uh, it's not strong for, for the following reason. Um, as these inputs collide onto a ring of, of actual inputs that, that you follow forever once you're on it, um, everything that's hanging off the ring is irrelevant at some point. And AFF1, as it's used in GSM, computes 100 iterations of itself before it's used for the first time. Meaning, if you start at some random state that's determined by your secret key, you are guaranteed to do 100 steps before any output is computed that would be visible from the outside. So, chances are that after 100 steps, you are on the ring. Or conversely, if we want to attack something, only the ring is relevant. And this ring is 2 to the 61 and not 64. Not a huge improvement, factor of 8. Um, but still, this, this puts us over the threshold of, of, of real practicality. Um, factor of 8 in both disk space and time, or if you combine the two into time, a factor of 30. So this makes it uh, run on one computer instead of a full room of computers in a couple of seconds. I just wanted to mention it. Um, as, a, as an improvement, we, we stumbled um, upon while, while implementing this decipher. So, um, LFSRs would be a nice ring, and LFSRs are not. Uh, it's important to use some non-linearity. I'm not trying to advertise LFSRs here, um, but the way it's used in GSM decreases the key space below what people thought it would be. Now, um, let's get back to, 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 to the main storyline. We were saying we want to trade off disk space and attack time. Um, and but we, so we, we don't want to compute the corner case 
where we have a data set with, with names and phone numbers, as I was describing, two column data set, because that's too large, 100 petabytes. Uh, we want to compute a similar data set, though. A data set um, that computes the A51 function not once, but a couple of times in a chain and then stores the first and the last value in this chain. Right? Straightforward attack, um, the, the straightforward um, idea of computing things like this that were known for, 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 for decades now and that were optimized a couple of times, once by, by, by this gentleman in the first row here. Um, now, without the optimizations, um, the, the way you would use this data set is the following. Um, you find some value on the air in the face. Now, this being a value that's, that's in the, in the middle, one of the middle columns, meaning it's not actually stored in the data set. You only start so the, the beginning and the end. Um, so you look, you look the value up in your data set um, and you don't find it. Uh, you don't give up though, but instead compute a 51 on what you saw on the other phase, you again look up the second value, you don't find it again, and you keep computing a 51 until you find a value that's actually stored in your two terabyte data set, say. Um, and from that value, um, you look up the corresponding start value of that chain and compute the chain until you find the secret key that was used to compute whatever you saw on here. Straightforward attack and works beautifully. So if you want to get from petabytes to terabytes, this chain needs to be something like a million links long. Um, so instead of now spending one computation and one database lookup, you spend a million computations and a million database lookups, but you actually can put it in realistic space on one hard disk, right? And a million computations isn't all that much for a computer. A million hard disk lookups is though, and we'll, we'll, we'll get an optimization to, um, to, to um, cut down the, the, the amount of, of hard disk lookups um, we need soon. Um, one other problem was, was this, this type of layout. Um, as beautiful as it sounds, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work in practice for statistical reasons. Um, you would want full coverage of this data set over, over your entire key space, or at least um, the 2 to the, the, the 61 key space we, we determined as relevant. Um, however, um, if you do just keep adding chains to this table, you're creating a lot of redundancy. As soon as, as values um, collide on each other and there's a strong statistical draw towards collision through this nonlinear property, um, as soon as um, values collide, the rest of these chains will be exactly the same. Right? So you're creating redundancy and you'll never actually get 2 to the 61 coverage. So there's another optimization um, that that, that solves this problem. But let's talk about the, the one that, that saves on um, hard disk lookups first. Um, so we were saying one million CPU computations, not a problem. One million hard disk lookups, much too expensive for a real, realistic attack. So what you do is the following. Instead of computing the chains for a determined number of times, for a static number uh, of links, um, you compute your chain until you hit a certain criteria. In this case, say the, the last the last two digits being zero, right? Um, and only then you call your chain finished. So those will be variable in length, but they'll always end in in a in a number with a with a certain property. And you only store those numbers on your hard disk. So in the attack phase now. Um, you again see a value on the air interface, and you compute A51 on it without looking into your data set until you hit a value with exactly those statistical properties. Right? So now you're down to an attack that was a million CPU with one hard disk. And that again gets us into the, 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 the area of, um, of, of seconds, um, given, given some practical constraint. Here's the second optimization we're doing to, um, to prevent that problem of, of our data set getting increasingly redundant. Um, and this optimization is due to, to Philip um, a couple of years ago. He, he implemented this idea called the, the rainbow tables. Um, 
on um, to, to compute the first practical uh, rainbow tables, but the, the first practical time memory trade-offs against uh, back then Windows caches, right? Passwords tracking. Um, now the idea is to instead of computing the same function, the A51 function on every link, to compute a slightly different function. All of them, of course, should be derived from A51 to still be relevant. But so in our case, we use uh, a function A51 x or one. A51, XO2, A51, XO3, and so forth. And those are called different colors, hence the rainbow, right? They're stretching through, through the different colors of a rainbow. Um, given that now, on every link of the chain, the function is different, a collision that happens at disjoint links of the chain, say like here, um, doesn't actually cause redundancy beyond this one number. The next link of the chain will be different in both these chains because you compute a different color. So if this is, uh, again, a million links long, um, you decrease the effect of collisions by a factor of a million through this method. Right? The cryptographic community was, was a little bit fighting um, between this and this. These optimizations, they, um, they were both um, considered a breakthrough, uh, but Few people um, have, um, could, could decide which one is better, and we, we didn't want to decide either. We'll just do both um, in the following way. So uh, now, as the optimal parameters for for, for, for our design space, and there's a huge Excel model I can share with you that that computes um, the parameters for, for every um, every design uh, for, for every every um, key space. Um, we compute with one color until we hit a distinguished point. This distinguished point is the certain parameters that follow certain statistical properties. Then change the color and compute to the next distinguished point. Again, change the color and do this a couple of times. Um, in our current data set, eight times. And only then we call the, the um, table finished. Still, this setup um, creates too much redundancy to, to ever reach the two to the 61. Um, which is why we compute, I think, 32 um, independent data sets, all of, all of them composed of, of this value. So now there's 32 data sets of chains that compute eight distinguished points, each with a different color, and that, from our calculation, seems the optimal way of breaking eight of one on commodity hardware. Um, two GPUs find um, find an A51 key in something like three seconds in this data set. Um, it costs something like 100,000 um, HDD lookups. Um, so usually your, your heart is, is the bottleneck, unless, of course, you have piles of um, SSD storage. So given, given a terabyte of SSD storage um, and two GPUs, Downloading this, this data set from the internet gives you um, a three, four seconds A51 cracker. Something that if you buy it um, commercially as an intelligence um, accessories um, will cost you almost a million dollars. So now it's open source and um, people should understand that A51 isn't actually a million dollars uh, secure, but instead two, two graphics cards and a pile of USB sticks secure. Um, almost out of time, I just want to run through another cipher though, just to, to show that um, while this was attacking the, the, the key size, 64 bits, um, and we had to, to go through a lot of optimizations to break 64 bits, that doesn't mean that a cipher much above 64 bits couldn't be broken. Um, and on a, on just two, two minutes span on, um, breaking the DAC cipher that was designed by the same group as A51, but a couple of years later was not designed anymore with the, uh, with, with the uh, claim of, of not leaking a good cipher to the Russians. Now this is after the Cold War. Um, so it was designed with 80 bits key instead of 64. So if you were to compute rainbow tables, um, this is what, 64,000 times uh, more difficult or something. Um, so you, you need you need houses full of hard disks and, and houses full of graphics card, and it would still take you years to break it. Um, again, a nonlinear 
uh, feedback shift register based cipher um, that in a lot of um, in, in, in a lot of ways is similar to A51, just better. Right? It's A51 plus um, plus. It's, it's bigger, it has uh, more independent units, um, it has more nonlinearity in the output stage, so it's strictly better cryptographically speaking, except for one optimization that, from what I hear from the designers, uh, was, was enforced by, by um, implementation transference. They didn't have enough time in this protocol. So instead of doing the 100 plots we were talking about earlier, that, that create this nice smaller cycle, they only do 40 plots. You think this is an optimization parameter that after um, increasing every other statistical property of the cipher wouldn't hurt you very much, uh, but the contrary is true. Through decreasing um, the pre-ciphering, as we call it, um, this now becomes invertible. Statistic, at least with, with some statistical bias, um, and allows us to attack it algebraically. Um, so there's a different type of trade-off here. We were talking about a memory time trade-off before. Now we're facing a data um, time trade-off, meaning the more samples you can collect of your victim, the faster you can break the encryption key that you're using. Um, but conversely, the longer a conversation goes on, the faster you can break the key that encrypted the entire conversation. Um, we, we released um, earlier this year um, an attack that's, that, that's far from practical because somebody would actually have to, to be on the phone for, for several hours for us to break it, but at least it's some, some hint that this can be broken. And this being the first attack, we, we don't claim to be the best cryptographers. So we, we think that that somebody like Adi Shamir would, would be able to implement this more realistically. Let's say a couple of minutes call would be broken in a couple of additional minutes. Um, so suffice it to say, 80-bit um, keys can also be broken, uh, but their hacks have to be very specific to the cipher, find statistical flaws and, and, and leverage those statistical flaws, and usually um, do this there's only was a small chance of success on every single data item, meaning you need a whole pile of, of input data to work on it. While the time memory trade-off attacks, of course, are much easier to implement, and they are generic and work on, on, on one data item. So, in, in some sense, um, they are preferred as long as you can do that. Um, long story short, um, don't, don't use proprietary crypto. It will be found. And it can be broken in a couple of different ways. Um, don't try to be cheap in, in, in hardware. Try to optimize something to, to be as small as possible in hardware. There's no point in it anymore today anyway, uh, where, where, where even, even contactless um, devices that are powered remotely over, over inches can compute RSA in milliseconds. There's really no point not using RSA or AS in, in this, this world anymore. Um, so with that, I, I hope um, you, you saw how, how easy these things are that we're doing, and hopefully I encourage a couple of you to, to, to attempt a couple of maybe breaking some crypto yourself at some point. Um, with that, thank you very much. And looking forward to some of your questions. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, have you ever seen a proprietary cipher that is not weak? Oh, sure, yeah, I yeah. am. All the ones that have, that have gone through lots of academic testing. Um, the way new ciphers are being born these days is by um, asking the academic community to first provide suggestions, second, provide attacks on these suggestions. I'm just thinking about proprietary cipher which are not known to this academic track. Oh, um, no. I have not, no. Um, yeah, I've, I've even seen, say, deviations from standard ciphers, uh, DAS, AS, where people thought they were smart by, by using this entire knowledge that went into, say, creating AS, but then changing it a little bit. So not even AS group forces would work against their cipher. Those little changes break it entirely, right? So, yeah, it, it seems that that the ciphers, as, as we use them in, in, the, in, in the public domain, um, 
they are, they are extreme spikes in a design space where if you change anything, they are break, breakable. And if people come up with their own cipher, um, they're usually not, not ever on any of these spikes. They're just somewhere down with your weak ciphers. Yeah, and my second question is the following. Uh, Why I, uh, I agree that uh, mounting a terminal trade-off against uh, A51 uh, does work in theory. Uh, basically, you need one known plaintext text in order to, or to stick to one known plaintext text in order to mount your terminal trade-off. Mm -hmm. And my question is the following. Does there exist such redundancy in an A51 that are yeah. on stream? Or yeah, yeah. We, we were, we were, there, there was a GSM. Um, GSM hacking workshop, the, the two days prior to this, and we, we looked in, into exactly this question in, in a great level of detail. And we found something like um, eight places with four large pads of 100 bits of known plain text in every single call setup in, in the way cells are operated at the moment. And that's something just to, to, to catch everybody else in. Um, so we can, we can attack a stream cipher if we know what came out of the stream cipher. Right? The way it's used in uh, the, the way a stream cipher usually is used, though, is that whatever comes out of the stream cipher is XORed with speech or some user data. That's unpredictable. It's noise. It's everything. So even just the combined thing over the air interface, um, you, you don't get the input you need to feed your, your cryptographic tracker. So you need some portion of the data exchange that's predictable. We know what data was XORed with your key stream, so you can XOR it out again and have to pure key stream. And A51, as it's used in GSM, there's, there's dozens of places. There, there's, there's static messages that are first being sent unencrypted, then they switch to encryption, and then they, they keep sending them every second. And you know exactly what and in what time slot they should, should be. So every second they give you some data that you can break. And initially, in the call setup, another some eight messages. Right. A good question. In deck, it's not so easy. In in deck, that all none of this exists. So collecting um, these five hundred thousand samples we need for this attack is is, is different for every phone. Right. Other questions? Thank you. Do you know how the the cost of the GPU implementation of the attack compares with that of a of an implementation on GPU on an FPGA? Um, well, um, an FPGA is, is superior um, in, in when, whenever a skilled FPGA designer does it. Um, the, uh, whether the, the additional programmer cost will be worth um, doing it, I don't know. But with an FPGA, you can get sub-second tracking results. With a GPU, the way it works, um, you'll never get below um, two seconds, I think. Regarding the cost of the other devices, uh, you know, how, how you compare the, the cost in, in other ways? Um, we, we have, and um, so if I remember correctly, FPGAs are something like um, half as expensive in, in purchasing cost for the same bank, but they are about 10 times as efficient in power consumption. If you operate the regular cryptographic tracker, um, the main expense will not be purchasing the device, but feeding it with electricity. So, and their FPGAs are much superior, right? Like the, the AFF1 cracker I have at my home uses something like 700 watts for, for two graphics cards. That's just ridiculous, right? And with FPGAs, you, you put it in a little box and, and have it mobile with, on a car battery, probably. Uh, I have a question with respect to DK. Uh, I you said that take it performs image processing to identify blocks. What if, I, I'm pretty sure that if you're doing a cryptographic block, you don't use these automatic synthesis tools, you manually place it. And I can always obscure them with, as in, I can make them look like a memory block, but, so it does take it also. Like how do you handle such a scenario? Well, um, good question, but, well, Maybe as a response to, to your claim of if you were to design cryptography, you would be doing it this way. Nobody who, who designs scripts who's actually does obfuscate, with one exception, one, one, one memory encryption on an Infineon smart card, 
Um, they scrambled this some 10 years ago and ever since used the exact footprint in every, of the, every single one of their chips. Um, however, that just increases the, 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 the reverse engineer complexity by one order of magnitude. Because now you don't look at these, um, these, these nice assembly instructions anymore. Um, now you look at the bits, and there's no hiding. The transistors will be there, and they will be interconnected, and you can count the transistors and draw lines, and that's your function. So instead of um, reverse engineering groups of maybe 10 transistors, you reverse engineer every single transistor. One out of maybe two, not that much. More questions? Cast a note, thank you. Thanks.